good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Labor Day, Labor Day weekend. Yay. End of summer. Boo. <laughs> Start of fall. Yay. <laughs> Well, I want to extend a warm welcome to everyone that's here today. I know that some of our folks, Pastor Mark and Cindy, are away this weekend vacationing, so we hope that those that are vacationing will be safe. We'll keep them in our prayers. Um, let's open with a word of prayer. Almighty God, we thank you that once again we can gather together with our brothers and sisters and worship you. I, we know, Lord, that none of us are here this morning by accident, that it's your will that we are here today. Help our hearts be open to what it is that you have for us to receive today from you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, there's a few announcements I would like to highlight this morning. Uh, September 12th, there will be a new uh, Bible study starting that's on Tuesdays. And the uh, study is going to be an eight-week study called Waiting for God. So if anybody's interested in that, um, Bonnie can order books for you. You can see me after, I'm not sure if there's a sign-up sheet in Jewel. Usually there is, yes. Sign up in Jewel Hall. There will also be a potluck that day. Uh, our Jenny Maxwell usually runs that show. Jenny, wave your hand for those that don't know you. There she is. Uh, our Kids Jam program, Wednesday night program, will be starting on the 13th. Uh, today is going to be our first, uh, our new fall uh, Sunday school program, a little bit different from our Sunday Jam that we had. Uh, so there's classes for adults and for children, um, and that's immediately following worship this morning at 11. Also, the orientation for higher ground, which meets on Thursdays, will be September 14th. Um, and there's also a fun thing I'd like to announce, uh, book club. Gloria is going to be leading a new book club starting October 1st through October 29th. And the book that we'll be studying is, What If God Wrote Your Bucket List? Hmm. Kind of thought-provoking, isn't it? <laughs> and I have a, uh, a note that I would like to read here. It says, Dear Church Family, Thank you for all your prayers. We are doing well. Lane is about to start his third semester of vet school. The island is beautiful, always sunny, beautiful, but also hot and humid. We have found a church here called Caribbean Christian Fellowship and really enjoy it. Thank you for your continued prayer support. Love, Lane, Julia, Sophie, and Shelley. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Lane and Julia are a lovely young couple from our church, and he is attending vet school at St. Kitt, so that's... That's what that's about. So, and it's hot. Judy just came back, and Teresa, they'll attest to that. Um, and now I'm going to turn things over to David. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I'll attack. Uh, I'll attack. No, I won't. I'll tack a little announcement on uh, to what Marilyn said. We had a, a very successful Sunday jam for 19 weeks. Um, I keep telling everybody we had 19 weeks and zero discipline problems, so that is a major blessing. Um, we want to thank everybody, especially who made cookies and who brought snacks every week. We really appreciated everybody's willingness to join in and help. If you were back there every week working with the program, we have a card that we'd like to give you as well. Um, talk to Chrissy after the service if she hasn't already given you one. Um, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you because those kids really appreciate a church coming together to give them this program. <clears throat> with that said, um, let's stand together. Let's, let's begin with worship. I have a few questions for you.
we'll go ahead and be seated right here because we've got a long way to go on this next one. <clears throat> this fits with the sermon last week. It's a little reminder of what we went through. This is from Acts. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had got a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night... An angel of God, who as I am and whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. So we're going to go through the stages of a storm. Um, we'll start with a... Uh, a song. How many of you know this song, My Lighthouse by Ren Collective? One, two, three, four. Okay. <laughs> well, this will be interesting then. It moves right along. Um, we've been singing it with the kids in the back. And even I get out of breath, so feel free to take a break out of line if you need to. But um, this is how it goes.
Good morning, everyone. This time I want to go to the Lord with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we can gather here. And Lord, we thank you for our freedom that we can gather here. And Lord, we just ask that your presence and your spirit would come upon us, Lord. May we have open hearts and minds to whatever it is that you want to say to us this morning. Lord, we pray that you will draw our hearts close to you, Lord. And Lord, may you be honored by our praises and our worship. Lord, help us to remember that that all of this is about a closer relationship with you, Lord. And Lord, there's many things on our hearts that are heavy, many things that that um, are hurting, uh, or shames, or guilt, or fear, Lord. We just ask that you would lift that off from our hearts and our minds, Lord. We pray that you will uh, just receive our worship, Lord, and be honored by it, Lord. And Lord, we also want to pray for Elaine Clark. Lord, we pray for healing from this pneumonia. We pray uh, that you'd give her strength and give her the help that she needs, Lord. And Lord, all that we do here this morning, all that we say, all that we think, all that we uh, sing and praise to you, Lord, may it all be for your glory. Lord, you are worthy. And Lord, we just want to uh, just worship you with all of our hearts. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If the ushers would come forward. We've had a new little girl in daycare for the past couple weeks. And um, she has the speech impediment. She's kind of hard to understand. And uh, we didn't know much about her family when she came. But uh, she would sing to herself a lot. And eventually we picked out one of the tunes. And then we could kind of understand the words a little bit better. And she would go off by herself and she would sing this song so loud that we could hear her from anywhere in the yard or the house. Um, so we found out a lot about her family that way and a lot about her heart, even though she's only four years old. Uh, so this song, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. If we can sing it as loud as she, she did, that would be great. Amazing Grace, how sweet. probably uh, haven't seen me for a while because I've been preaching, seems like all over the state. I was in Mancelona for a while and uh, filled in at Lakeview for a little bit too. And uh, I knew going ahead that I would be in Mancelona for three weeks, so I was trying to find a book that was three chapters long to do. And I was looking through some of the minor prophets and it seemed like I was supposed to preach on Joel. 
So you're going to hear this morning the first of a three-part series, and you probably won't hear the next one for a few months, and who knows when you hear the third one. So, <laughs> But hopefully this will whet your appetite, and you'll be interested in uh, hearing the rest of the story. So, so many of you probably remember uh, back in 2020 and the pandemic, and, and I'm sorry to bring up any uh, uh, trauma from that, uh, but you probably remember going into the grocery stores and seeing the empty shelves. And I remember early on in the pandemic, before they kind of figured out the supply chain issues and all of that, just going into the stores, and it was like half or a third of the list, you couldn't get the stuff that you, want, that you needed for your, uh, uh, for your groceries for the week. And I, re I remember one time... Uh, I was still a pastor in Big Rapids, and I had to do a, uh, I was doing like a video thing on communion, and I didn't have any bread, so I had to use a tortilla shell, so uh, you get your flatbread that way, I guess. And so I remember this sinking feeling in my stomach, thinking that I couldn't get the stuff that we need, and, and we really didn't know when things would get better. And uh, people were doing everything they could to try and get through it and survive it. And people reacted all in different ways uh, to the virus people. You know, I saw everything from like a space helmet that filtered out your air uh, to uh, people not wanting to wear masks at all. And people that uh, would intentionally go out in public more than necessary to people that wouldn't leave their house. And we, we all respond to things in different ways. And unfortunately, a lot of times, we focus too much on what we can do to solve the problem and not enough on God helping us to get through the problem. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't use your wisdom and your judgment that God gives you. That's certainly important. But we often leave God out of the equation when we get into a situation that is really too big for us. And sometimes those situations are, are caused by our own doing anyway. So uh, when we try to get ourselves out of the hole, we end up digging ourselves into a bigger hole. And that's why it's so important that we kind of shift our focus on those situations on God instead of on everything that we can do. And honestly, I've had a number of situations in my life like that where you just kind of give it over to God and you, you have a lot more peace about it than trying to solve it on our own. So we're going to be looking at Joel chapter 1, and I'm just going to read through the whole chapter so uh, you can just sit back and listen, and, uh, and we'll, we'll see what Joel has to say about all of this. The word of the Lord came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. And listen, all inhabitants of the land, has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? Tell your sons about it and have their sons tell their sons and their sons the next generation. What the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. And what the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. Awake, you heavy drinkers, and weep, and wail, all you wine drinkers, because of the sweet wine, for it has been eliminated from your mouth. For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of lion, and it has the jaws of a lioness. It has made my vine a waste, and my fig tree a stump. It has stripped them bare and hurled them away. Their branches have become white, wail like a virgin clothed with sackcloth for the groom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off. From the house of the Lord, the priests mourn, the ministers of the Lord. The field is ruined, the land mourns, for the grain is ruined, and the new wine has dried up. Fresh oil has failed. Be ashamed, you farm workers. Wail, you vine dressers, for the wheat and barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed, and the vine has dried up. And the fig tree has withered, and the pomegranate, the palm also, and the apple tree. All the trees of the field have dried up. Indeed, joy has dried up from the sons of mankind. Put on sackcloth, 
Mourn, you priest. Wail, you ministers of the altar. Come and spend the night in sackcloth, you ministers of God. For the grain offering and drink offering have withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Proclaim a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Woe for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Has food not been cut off from before our eyes, and joy and rejoicing from the house of our God? The seeds have dried up under their shovels, and the storehouses have become desolate. The grain silos are ruined because the grain has dried up. How the animals have groaned. The herds of cattle have wandered aimlessly because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep have suffered. To you, Lord, I cry out. For the fires, fire has devoured the pasture of the wilderness, and the flame has burned up all of the trees of the field. Even the animals of the field pant for you, for the stream beds of water are dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. So a little bit of background to this passage. It happened between... Uh, 6th and 9th century BC, and it's focused on the areas in Jerusalem and Judea. So that, that's the focus of Joel and his ministry, and it's the focus of uh, his prophecy to uh, the people there. There's also some literary parallels between Joel and some of the other minor prophets. So Joel might have been influenced by them, or they might have been influenced by him, depending on when it was written. And then it's also known that Joel, Joel was not of the priestly background, uh, based on the description within the book. So we kind of see in this chapter, it's almost like the calm before the storm. You can kind of see what this plague of locusts is leading up to. So you... You hear of the different locusts eating up their crops. And then on top of that, you hear about the, the drought and then the fires. And so it's really a worst case scenario if you think about it, because in this day, they were able to trade with nations far away for their produce. They were dependent on what they were able to grow. And so they, they were really looking at a bleak future. It really wasn't much hope for them. So the main focus of this passage is on the locusts. And if you remember, there was a plague of locusts in Egypt. And this kind of draws back from that and kind of reminds the people of that situation, but it also is a real current event for them. We often don't realize it, but a lot of prophecies would have a near-term fulfillment and then a future fulfillment, like a, a long-term fulfillment. So this, this prophecy was something that was really going uh, to happen to these people, something that they were experiencing, something that they were going to go through. And, and that's kind of why I brought up the pandemic, because I remember hearing about it sweeping through China and then Europe and then Finally, it made it to us. And, you know, it's kind of that anticipation that, that makes things maybe even seem worse than they are. But you can kind of see what's happening and what, what's coming. And I'm a gardener. I like to grow things. And you can kind of get a sense of what you're going to get uh, even earlier on. You can kind of see what, what plants are coming up, which ones aren't. You can see what bugs or whatever are going to eat them, you know, eat off your leaves so you don't get anything or, or uh, you know, how healthy your plants are. And I can tell you, if you, don't, if you don't do what you can to protect your plants, some critter is going to get it. I even had a fence around my garden this year, and, and somehow a deer managed to climb over the fence and eat some of my corn. And then you get all sorts of little critters that will get in and eat stuff too. And the other thing to keep in mind is this was really their industry. This was their livelihoods. This was their work. Growing crops, raising livestock. And now not only 
do you no longer have food, but your livestock don't have food, and you know, your whole livelihood is just destroyed. There's an interesting parallel in this passage, and it, it kind of parallels the, the harvest with this famine that's going to be coming. So we still celebrate the harvest even today. I mean, there's lots of little towns around that have harvest festivals. And I know, like, with my garden, I always enjoy the fresh produce that we get. And it seems like you can, you can, there's more to enjoy. Like, you can enjoy more when you have more. So when you have nothing, obviously it's, it's a completely different feeling. It's, and you really don't even know what your future looks like, or if you even have a future, because you don't you don't have the food that you need anymore. So this parallel between famine and the harvest, the only sin that's really mentioned in this passage is drunkenness. And if you think about it, drunkenness is a sin of success, not success, <laughs> sin of excess. <laughs> Sorry, we'll just, we'll just edit that part out, right? So there's... The sin of excess. So when you, as I just said, when you have more, you tend to enjoy more. So when I go to the grocery store and come home with all that, the new food, the, the good snacks and stuff, I always end up eating a lot more earlier in the week. And then in the end of the week, when it's all gone, then I eat a lot less. So it's kind of the same thing uh, that they were experiencing. Uh, you, you tend to enjoy more when you have more. So this contra contrast with the famine and the harvest shows just how difficult things are. So Joel talks about certain, certain occupations like farmers and vine dressers and priests, and he calls them to wail. So they need to mourn because things aren't good. And really there's even a part that says they're not even able to, to give God an offering because they don't have anything to give. So it's easy to think when you face a situation like that, when you have no control over it, where it seems hopeless, it's easy to think, well, now what am I going to do? And we can come up with all sorts of ideas on our own. Some of them may be better than others. We can do all sorts of things to try to solve the problem ourselves. But how often do we turn to the Lord for help? How often do we let it go and give it to God to take care of it instead of trying to hold on ourselves and, and solve the problem ourselves? The other important trajectory of this passage is paralleling this day with the day of the Lord or judgment day. The Bible, the Old Testament always talks about the day of the Lord or Judgment Day, but the New Testament references it in terms of the second coming of Christ. And really, it's the same day. When Jesus comes back, that's the day of the Lord. That's, that's Judgment Day. That's when Jesus returns to take over, uh, essentially uh, repossess the earth. I mean, it's like, it's like humans are landlords who have been entrusted to take care of it, and then when, when God finally has enough, he's going to come back and Jesus is just going to, you know, take it back. And with that, there's judgment. So John 3, 16 through 18, we're pretty familiar with John 3, 16. And, and we always like to use it as a verse to remind people of um, God's love and his salvation and stuff. But we don't often think about it in terms of judgment. We always leave out the, the last couple verses, so I'm going to read it for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe in him has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name 
of the only Son of God. So, one of the best descriptions I've heard of the day of the Lord, uh, or when Jesus returns, is that everybody gets what's coming to them. So either we, <clears throat> we get the judgment we deserve because we don't believe in Jesus, what God has provided to save us, or we don't get the judgment that we do deserve because we do believe. Jesus took on that judgment that we deserve, but we have to accept it. I've heard so many people talk about, well, you know, my, my good's going to outweigh my bad, or, or all these sorts of things, but that's not what God provided for our salvation. It's not a, a matter of our effort. It's not a matter of what you can do. Really, there's nothing we can add to our salvation. Jesus did it all, and we either accept what God did for us, or we reject it. We repent of our sins and trust in Jesus, or we continue in our sins and trust in our flesh. We can be saved by grace through faith, but it's not by works. It's not, not a matter of our own effort. And we live in a world that celebrates pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and and solving things on our own and being successful based on our own merits. But really, how much of that do we really have control over, for one thing? And the other thing is, we're being judged by a perfect standard. Even, even the most righteous person aside from Christ who ever lived, they're still condemned to hell because they're sinners. They don't meet the perfect standard. They're, they don't meet the standard of Christ. So this goes right along with what Joel is saying, with what he's calling these people to do. We can't solve this problem on our own. We're going to die if we try, uh, you know, without God's help, we're going to die. There's nothing we can do. So the state that we are in, we, the Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all separated from God. Apart from Christ, we are all sinners. And so, without God doing something to save us, then it's hopeless. But God has provided that answer, and we do have that hope. Now, we don't experience the same thing. Thankfully, we, we haven't had any plagues that have wiped out the global food supply, because that would be very bad. But we do have plenty of difficult times in our life, plenty of situations that we have no control over. We can lose our job, our financial stability. We can lose someone that's close to us. We can suffer through difficult times, through trouble. And I think what Joel calls the people to do is something that we can apply in our situations when we go through those difficult times and even when we're not going through difficult times. Joel teaches the people to fast, seek the Lord, and call out to the Lord. So a fast was often used during a time of mourning or a time of trouble and it's really giving up food to show your dependence on God. It's giving up something that we normally rely on for our strength to get strength from God. So you can give up food or time or whatever to focus on God. So really, a fast is, is just turn your, your hearts, your minds, your attention, find your strength, find your help in God rather than in material things or rather than in your own strength. Seek the Lord. We often, there's usually this, whenever things are bad, we're more likely to, to seek God versus when they're good. It's always the good times that we, we kind of forget about God or we kind of focus more on the good things that we have and, and not enough on God. Because really, he is, 
He is the greatest thing that we have. Everything that we have here and now will be gone. But God's eternal. And he wants a relationship with us. It's not about following a bunch of rules. It's about accepting what God did for us with faith and having a relationship with God. Isn't that amazing to think that the creator of the universe wants a relationship with us? He wants to know us. He wants to to love us. And he provided a way, even though we've broken his rules, even though we've done so many things against him, he made a way, because he loves us so much, that we can be right with him. And he wants that relationship with us. And call out to the Lord. We need to show our dependence on God. Especially in those times that we have no control, when things are are bad. But even on regular, everyday things. That relationship, I really believe God wants that relationship on a daily basis. If you look at Adam and Eve in the garden, from how I read it, it seems like God went for walks with Adam like every day. Like this was a regular thing that they did. They had a relationship. And we need to remember that we need that relationship too. And we need to put in the effort to, to talk to God and focus on him and think about him. You might not be going through a situation like the people in Joel's day. You might not be going through a huge disaster or anything like that. But maybe you are going through some hard times. Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you lost a loved one. Maybe, maybe things just aren't going very well. And my challenge and my hope for all of you is that instead of trying to focus so much on our own effort and our own intellect to solve the problem and get through it. Take some time to let go of it. Give it to God. Seek the Lord. Seek his help. Seek a relationship with him. I can tell you from experience, whenever I face situations that are beyond me, and I, and I just give it to God. There's just, just so much more peace. And you can just know that God's going to work it out. And it's his problem now. You know, when you give it to him, it's his problem to take care of. And we can just trust in him. And yeah, it takes faith. It takes faith that God is going to take care of you. And it doesn't always turn out like you expect or maybe even hope, but a lot of times it turns out even better. And we we have this we have this tendency as humans to expect the worst. We we blow things out of proportions, we we think we hear something and you know, next thing we know, as long as when we focus on it, think about it, it it's just this huge disaster when if you just give it to God and don't worry about it anymore God will help you he will be with you he will help it turn out okay maybe not how you want but it'll be okay I heard this saying uh, from someone and it's don't rehearse your disasters and essentially we shouldn't focus so much on our problem that we forget about the solution because we already know the solution. God can help us. And if nothing else, he will walk beside us as we go through these troubles in our lives. We know life isn't always easy. But when we have that relationship with God, when we put our faith in him, when we trust that he can help us through that, when we seek him, He'll be there for us. He'll help us. And we can be at peace when we go through those hard times. And I know from a lot of people that there's there's a big lack of peace in our world. 
And yet God has provided access to that peace. So my hope for all of you is that you will seek the Lord, call out to him whenever you face these troubles. He is the answer, and he will help you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all of the good stuff in this book, Lord, and we just pray that you would help each and every one of us, whatever we're going through, Lord. Maybe we're doing well right now, and maybe we're starting to not spend as much time with you as we should, or maybe we are going through really tough times, and we don't know what to do. Lord, we just pray that that we will seek you, Lord, that we'll call out to you, that we will uh, that we will give up things so that we can just put our dependence on you. Lord, we thank you that, that you care about us, that you care about our every need. And Lord, we just pray that, that you would use all these situations for your glory, Lord. Draw us closer to you. Draw those around us closer to you, Lord. Let these, let these situations be opportunities to share with people how you have changed our lives and how you have helped us through difficult situations. And Lord, we just, we just thank you for the opportunity to learn more about you. We just love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I uh, heard a song this morning, and I don't really know it very well, but I'm actually going to try to sing it anyway. Um, just a verse and a chorus to send us out. I'll see if I can remember how it goes. My body is the temple of the living God. I'll worship in this house that his blood has bought. As I bear his image, oh, may I not profane the holiness I hold in this earthly frame. I belong to the Lord, though I am not my own. I belong to the Lord, I am not my own. I will honor Him, for this I know. I belong to the Lord, I am not my own. Have a good week. Go out and honor Him.